All right, this one's going to be a long one. So grab a drink or a snack. Now, background to this video. I've played this game for about eight or nine years now. And the majority of that, about seven of those years, I focus mainly on air realistic. All right. And in air realistic, for those who don't know, the uh, meta there is completely air to air combat. All right. You win the match by shooting down the enemy team. Every now and then, one out of 10 games, you'll get a victory by the enemy running down the tickets by taking out ground targets or they destroy the airfield. But those are very rare. Now, in all those years, I have yet to meet anybody who has had my enthusiasm for tactics. All right? The majority of the air realistic community is focused around lone wolf kind of like tactics, right? Uh, all the air to air stuff that you'll see uh, discussed on forums or on YouTube videos is always about just one aircraft. There's never any talk about multiple aircraft in a squad, uh, which is interesting because for me, uh, once I got to a certain skill level, and you've pretty much seen most of the tricks and you're just practicing. You wanted to go to the next level because you wanted to win games. And if uh, my thinking was, if you were able to bring other people that were of a similar skill level or better and were interested in winning games and you put together a squad and you figure out how to work as a team, then that should be able to get more better results. You should be able to win more games. But I, like I said, seven years going, never met anybody who ever cared about anything more than just one aircraft combat tactics. In this video here, I'm just going to talk about all the things that I've learned and the things that I managed to uh, see in terms of multiple aircraft working together, uh, how how the, the sources, as I've said before, when you're doing research for these things and you're looking for inspiration or things to help you from outside your area of expertise, or in this case, the area of the game, uh, you want to find things that are relevant and you have to be honest. And I've spent enough time in those seven years to know that most of the things here that I'm about to tell you, uh, they do work in-game. Now, how do I know that without actually having talked or played with people that understand these things? Well, the way that I approached it was uh, I understood what it was. I knew my wingman didn't, <laughs> or any of uh, any of the pe folks that I get into matches with. But I treat as if I'm going to play the playbook as I've studied it in books or websites or videos. All right, and I'm just going to pretend that the other guy, even though he doesn't know, he's still trying his very best to win the engagement. And let's say that it's a two-on-one or a two-on-two -on -two or two-on-many. Uh, uh, so long as I stick to the playbook as I know it and see how it turns out, I can then gauge whether or not if later on down the line, if I manage to find another guy who's, uh, who understands these principles, whether or not it worked out. And so far in my experience, uh, the limited experience that I've had, uh, it, it works out, all right? There have been about a couple of games where I managed to, on the fly, just give the one or two tips of how we're going to run this engagement against uh, enemy aircraft. And it's worked out great. It's worked out beautifully. And uh, I've got one example at the end here about a match played uh, that went like that. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll walk you through everything that I know about this. So I'm going to, as per usual, for all my videos, I'm going to put in the description the chapters because this is going to be a pretty long video and uh, quite a lot of different topics that I'm going to have to cover in this one video. Um, so first off, tactical formations. Uh, this is usually one of the first starting points when talking about air combat tactics, especially in a squad. And what I found out is that for the majority of things that you're going to find about air for tactical formations with multiple aircraft. Most of them don't work at all in game. <laughs> they are completely useless. And I'm about to tell you why. Uh, I have tried. Uh, usually the way I first tried it out was I would pretend that I was always the wingman because as I've said, the guys that I play with, whether I'm squatted or maybe if it's just a random blueberry on the team, I just pretend that I'm going to follow the playbook and see how this goes out. So usually in the beginning when I was trying to figure this out, I treated myself as the wingman in the formation. And 
we'll, we'll just see how how it plays out. That never worked out well for me. <laughs> and every now and then you'd find one, find a couple of guys, maybe one or two who, you know, shows a little bit of interest in it. And he says, all right, I'm going to be your wingman. And I'm telling him, okay, uh, you follow me. And that's also never worked out. <laughs> and here's the reason why, okay. It all has to do with the game mechanics, right? This is how War Thunder, how the game mechanics in game work. And the two things that uh, destroy the the relevance of tactical formations in air combat in War Thunder. One is the spotting system that you have, and in air arcade and air realistic, you have this spotting system, right? You have that uh, stat card of the the enemy name, player name, their aircraft, and the distance to you, all right? The the marker. You have that. Second thing of all is the nature of the game itself. You are put into a scenario where it's basically the map is a square. If you go to the map border, you can't go any further. It will just automatically respawn you at the edge of the map border, uh, flying towards the middle of the map. So you're restricted in your airspace. And in the case of uh, air realistic, you know where the enemy is starting. Uh, they, they have the airfields on the map. You can find out where they are. And air arcade, you pretty much spawn in the air right in front of each other. You know where everybody is. And you also know where the enemy air spawn is. That's also showed up on the map. And also, you know exactly how many people are in the game. You know how many of your teammates there are. You know how many of the enemy there are. When you bring up the tab, the leaderboard chart in game, you know how many players there are. And in Air Arcade, you also know what kind of aircraft they brought in the lineup, what kind of aircraft they're flying immediately then. In Air Realistic, you, you know, it has to take some time as the game progresses to uh, manually spot them as uh, you get closer towards the enemy. But the fundamentals still apply. With markers and the knowledge that the of the force compositions of your team, the enemy team, plus the restriction of the map, all of these factor in and make all of the reasoning behind the tactical formations that the folks in the real world use, they all go out the window, all right? Because the two main reasons why uh, folks fly tactical formations, and this is I got this from uh, Boyd's book on uh, aerial attack study. Uh, the first one is to provide security against enemy attacks and enemy fighters. Security in this sense means to be able to detect the enemy as they come in and maneuver against their offensive uh, maneuvers. Detect and maneuver. The detection part in the game, as I've said, is out the window because you can pretty much see a giant red dot out there exactly what his distance is, whether he's coming towards you or away. Even if you bring up the map, you'll be able to see the diamonds, which way they're moving. So it's not that hard. The detection part goes out the window. There's no need to fly in formation like this. And the second part about uh, flying in tactical formations is to conduct offensive operations. Now, this part here, the there is relevance to that. And I'm about to talk about the my method of flying formations, all right? It's, it doesn't follow most of the, the standard uh, accepted rules that you will find in books or the real world stuff. That, that's, that's not how it is. But for, for folks that are approaching it, tactical formations, as you find in books, like all these ones that you see here, they, they're basically useless. You, you basically handicap yourself because every time you try to fly a formation like this, you're gonna end up spending more time trying to stay in formation then looking for targets or engaging targets or protecting your 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 leader, your wing leader or your wingman, right? That's just the way it is. So what actually does work then? And is, uh, is formations in general just completely out of whack? If that is the case, then you're probably thinking now, well, then why bother with anything else then? Uh, there is only one part here that, that stays relevant, right? Uh, it's what I call the 600 meter rule. So long as you are within 600 meters of friendly aircraft, which you're going to try to operate with, all right, this is considered the formation, right? You don't need to fly wingtip to wingtip or in an echelon or in a line or anything like that. You only need to be within 600 meters. And sometimes you don't even need to be flying in the same direction to be considered in what I consider to be a formation that provides uh, what Boyd uh, said about providing security against enemy attacks. 
or to conduct inf uh, offensive operations. Uh, now, the reason why uh, 600 meters is that 600 meters is the effective range for guns. Uh, in jets, you might uh, might have to extend this number a little bit, but uh, 600 meters and within, or the prop World War II aircraft kind of stuff, this is, this is fine because this is the effective range of your guns. So if anything happens to your wingman, you're in the position to immediately react and provide help and support. If you go further beyond this, uh, I believe if you go up to about a kilometer or so, you might still be able to get away with it. But staying within 600 is uh, is better. All right, you'll be able to act react uh, react faster and help get to help your wingman faster. But 600 meters, it gives you a plenty of space to maneuver. It means that uh, if you are trying to work as a unit, it means that you guys are close enough to be considered as a concentrated force, right? That, that, that's one way of the reasoning behind flying formations uh, to conduct offensive operations. You still need to be close enough together to be able to provide mutual support. If you're flying across the other side of the map, yeah, okay, maybe you've got comms and maybe you guys have squatted up, but you're not you're not helping each other out, all right? So this 600 meter rule is what I've come up with. And so far it's worked out well for me. Uh, usually I've been the, the wingman following whoever it is I'm trying to help because as I said, most of the time, I've never talked with my uh, wingman in Air Realistic about how we're going to approach this. I just I just try to play it uh, from my side of view and see my point of view and see how it works. So this this right here, this one's worked out well so far. And if you are able to get another guy to approach the game using my method, it, it will work out real well, right? Now proceeding to the one exception to all of the, the formations that I've uh, discarded in the uh, second slide here, the combat spread. Now, uh, some people don't really consider this to be like a uh, real tactical formation, partly because it's just two planes flying next to each other. <laughs> that, that's basically the combat spread. But uh, the way the way that uh, I approach it is, uh, as you see here in this diagram here, uh, the point of the combat spread was to provide a vision, you know, as Boy said, security by detection. Uh, this this is not what the purpose why you want to fly the combat spread. We're using my method now in conjunction with the 600 meter rule uh, for conducting offensive operations. It will be far more effective if you are flying both in the same direction. So as I said here before, uh, in my my method to be considered in formation, you don't necessarily need to be flying in the same direction. You could even be flying in opposite directions, but so long as you're within like 600 meters to about a kilometer, that that that's okay. You can you can work together, and most of the maneuvers that I'm about to discuss, you can pull that off so long as you're within this 600 meter rule kind of thing, right? 600 to about a kilometer. So if we're talking about uh, prop aircraft, World War II era stuff kind of thing. So combat's bad here. Uh, if, we, if we're going to be conducting the offensive operations, which is basically about half of the stuff that I'm about to talk about, this is how you want to approach it. You want to be flying in the same direction towards the enemy, all right? And your distance, 600 meters closer, maybe out to a kilometer. That 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 this is how this is how the the offensive playbook is. Uh, for like a sports term analogy, I suppose. This is how it's going to start out. This is how it's going to play out. All right, nothing too fancy. You don't need to be flying wingtip to wingtip. You don't need to be flying in echelon or any this, that, or the other. This is as fluid and a dynamic a system. And that's important in air combat, all right? You can't, you can't afford to fly textbook, you know, following like geometrical... Uh, maneuvers how many degrees here how many good degrees there that, that in practical reality that that does not work it's gonna it's as i said before it's more of a handicap because you're putting more work on yourself and you're also not really helping to achieve what it is you're trying to achieve you're not you're not trying you're, it's not really helping you out to shoot down the enemy aircraft that covers the tactical formation part now we go on to doctrines uh i've I listed three here um, this is the three that I, I got from the book. Uh, I've got all the sources that I consulted at the very last slide here. So if you guys want to have a look at that, I have it at the end. So the book that I consulted, they listed three. 
Uh, I'm fairly confident there there are a lot more, but these are sort of like the three big ones, so to say. Uh, the first one here, Fighting Wing. So that basically is what what I've been talking about. It's about formations of aircraft that are flying together in tight formations and then going into battle, flying together in those formations. All right, this is like really really old school kind of stuff. This is like the pre World War Two era kind of doctrine for the British, and I'm not sure how the Americans had it at the time, but that's how that's how the approach and thinking to air combat was. You fly in formations, and you fight in formations. So, as I said, formations completely useless <clears throat> for the most part. Don't don't try it. All right, it's not gonna get you far. Okay, so we're not gonna talk about that. What we are gonna talk about is the double attack and loose deuce. Now. What are these two things? So the basic principles which behind these two doctrines is that uh, we focus on two ship, two aircraft units called elements or sections. People have different terms, but it's basically two aircraft working in conjunction. There are other doctrines that involve odd number aircraft, like three, five, whatnot. And uh, there, there is also the the multiple aircraft, multiple sections. So maybe you have multiple sections of like four aircraft split into two, maybe six, 12. Uh, those don't matter because the principal foundations behind these doctrines is two aircraft working together. If you understand how these two aircraft work together, how they conduct their offensive and defensive maneuvers, if you add any more aircraft to the mix and more friendly aircraft, for example, so long as you understand the principles, they then apply all right, they, they, the principles stay the same. So if you had another pair here, so long as they both understand the principles when they go into an engagement against, maybe it's like a four and six, uh, it'll be fine. There's no extra added uh, theory or advanced tactics that you need to learn. It, it's all the same. And as you play more games and uh, hopefully, if you play more games with another wingman, uh, this will become apparent pretty fast. All right, and as you get practice in, uh, it will become second nature. So, double attack. We'll talk about that first. So, in double attack, you have the designated uh, element leader. He's going to be the attacker or the offensive uh, fighter, and the wingman is the defensive fighter. Right, he's the cover. Okay. And double attack here, okay. Uh, before the engagement happens, this is determined. Who is the element leader? Who is the wingman? Element leader is uh, the, the offensive fighter. The wingman is the defensive fighter. The offensive fighter is the one that engages the enemy target, okay. So here, let's, uh, we're going to assume that the blue arrows are our fighters, red arrows are bandits. In this example here, the offensive fighter is going in and starts engaging the bandit. And in double attack, what the wingman does is the wingman, he doesn't fly, as I said, in formation. He doesn't try to like stick with him with every maneuver as they do, because that would be useless. What the wingman here does as the defensive fighter or the cover fighter, he's going to stay close enough here to provide support, but he is providing security. Okay, He's not trying to actively engage. The offensive fighter is actively engaging. The wingman is keeping his eyes open for other threats, other enemy bandits, uh, um, anything that may threaten the the offensive fighter or maybe even threaten himself. He he is just defending the offensive fighter in this engagement to make sure nothing interferes with it and make sure that nothing jumps himself. Uh, that's double attack, all right? Now, it's not so rigid. Uh, as I said, there is a pre-engagement uh, so uh, pre-engagement rule where you have to select who's going to attack first. But the thing about double attack, uh, unlike in Fighting Wing, both roles can interchange. So depending on where the bandit is or depending on how the fight uh, progresses, if the offensive fighter finds himself out of position, maybe he overshoots, the bandit, then the defensive fighter, he then can switch 
to be the offensive one, and the offensive fighter switches to defense. Because most likely, if uh, the offensive fighter has engaged a bandit, he's overshot, he's out of position, the wingman who's been flying cover for him, he probably still has altitude or he has a better position because he's been watching the engagement go down and he's been watching the area for threats. He'll be in a good position to commence his own attack, in which case then the roles switch and the, the cover fighter becomes the offensive fighter, the offensive fighter becomes the cover. So it's very fluid, very very dynamic. Now, I I don't really recommend using this partly because uh, the the third doctrine here, loose deuce, is in my experience for War Thunder far more effective. And the reason why is once again due to the game mechanics. As we said before, the purpose behind these like uh, the initial formations and whatnot provide security, but as uh, with marking systems and understanding that you already know how many aircraft there are, what kind of aircraft they are, and in which space they can maneuver. There's only so many options where the enemy can come from if you're playing in a restricted battle space, which War Thunder, that's how the game goes. There's no real need for a cover fighter. There's no real need to have a designated, dedicated person to fly cover for anybody. All right. Uh, for example, the way I found this out, uh, is in air realistic, what we usually do, well, what I usually do and most of the, the guys I used to play with is the, we side climb, all right? We take off and we don't go straight for the enemy airfield where they are hoping to get into an engagement fast. We go to the sides and we climb at altitude. And what this does is it doesn't just mean that you gain superior position when you get into an engagement. What this also does is that any other teammates that are not side climbing and they go off trying to look for a quick engagement and a quick kill, what they do for you is that they detect all the enemy aircraft. They get the markers up. You find out what kind of aircraft the enemy is flying, who's flying them, and where they are generally. And once you've established this information, then you don't need the defensive fighter because you already know where all the threats are and you know what kind of threats there are as well. As the game progresses and as the kills mount, you get the kill feed so you know who's died, who shot who. And if you look up the tab leaderboard, uh, their names will be grayed out because you they're dead, they're out of the game. So you now know how many aircraft are left on the enemy team. The, the purpose and job responsibilities of the cover fighter in double attack, it, it diminishes as the game progresses. And in air arcade, there's really no point because pretty much at all times know where they are. <laughs> in air arcade, the spotting system is, is different and air realistic. You basically know where everybody is at all times. So double attack, th those those are the main principles behind it, uh, which is why I don't recommend flying it. What I do use is the loose deuce here. Now, what's the difference between loose deuce and double attack? Now, in principle, loose deuce is still a two ship, two plane uh, doctrinal form, uh, not formation, but uh, it's based on pairs, right? Same as double attack. And most of the maneuvers between loose deuce and double attack are the same. The only difference here is in loose deuce, there is no designated defensive fighter, all right? Uh, now you probably ca caught on here. <laughs> if there's no need for a defensive fighter, then have both of them be offensive fighters. And that's what the main doctrinal difference is between loose deuce and double attack is that both aircraft, when they get into an engagement, they're both offensive fighters. Uh, the only slight variation here and the slight rule is uh, usually you don't want to have two aircraft engaging a single target. There are a lot of reasons why, usually because if both are focusing on one, uh, collisions are uh, prone to happen and I've seen this happen many times and I've been a part of collisions <laughs> of this sort many times as well and it's also not a good uh, good use of your numbers all right as we've said before we already know there are only a fixed number of aircraft in both teams when we get into the game why you want to put two guys attacking one uh, you're wasting one guy basically he can go off and attack somebody else uh, so in loose deuce you have two offensive fighters, and 
both are jockeying for position to attack. Uh, the way it works out here, for example, is the element leader, because he's closest, he engages first. And the wingman, what he does is he's actively trying his very best to set himself up for an immediate attack. So if the element leader misses or he overshoots, or he can't get the kill, he runs out of ammunition, he breaks off, whatever reason why, the wingman is already in an immediate position to conduct his attack. So the bandit here has no break. No break in in, uh, in the rhythm of the attack, in the timing of the attack. In double attack, there will be a slightly longer period where he'll be able to recover himself, uh, gain, regain situational awareness, maybe even regain energy. But in loose use, it's a constant, constant offense. So this is the preferred method. So it's the loose use doctrine of how they work together, plus the combat spread and the 600 meter rule. These are the three main things that uh, make up my offensive playbook and when approaching air combat in War Thunder. And this works for air arcade or air realistic, either one. Uh, just to clarify some things as I was rewatching the part about the loose deuce here. Um, when I talk, when I say about not committing two two fighters to one bandit, right? And uh, you're probably thinking that the entire point of double attack and loose deuce is to have two guys attack one guy. What I mean by that is that at any one time, and we're talking like the seconds here in the actual engagement, you don't want to have both the fighters trying to shoot down the bandit. That's where the collisions occur. And that's where the use of force is uh, is wasted, so to say, right? You want to keep one guy free. But the one guy, as I've said, he's following the doctrine of setting himself up for attack if anything goes wrong with the initial attack of the offensive fighter, right? Now, the other thing I forgot to add here about loose deuce is the disadvantage. The main disadvantage here is that if you go up against uh, multiple bandits, uh, yeah, you're not going to be committing two to one in that case because you're going to leave one bandit out that's going to get behind you. In loose deuce, in that case, if we're fighting a two on two, uh, one fighter goes against one bandit, the other fighter goes against the other bandit. And what happens here is that it's very, very easy for both fighters to become separated beyond the 600 meter, the one kilometer kind of range. And when that happens, uh, you lose mutual support. Uh, this is this is a bigger disadvantage about loose deuce, but you can't have everything, all right? So yeah. Before we get on to all the different maneuvers and tactics, uh, I'll just add here uh, three-man tactics. And I'm only adding this because this is something that I've done. And uh, I'll just let everybody know what my experience has been with this. So this is the uh, section and stinger. So you have, the, you have a section of two fighters and a stinger of one. So this one dude here, he he's not flying anywhere near in formation to the section, all right? So in my method, that means that he'll be beyond one kilometer, maybe even be like two or three kilometers away from the section. And usually what happens here is that uh, we'll climb for altitude, side climb for altitude, go over to the engagement, have the section engage whatever targets it is that we're going into, and the stinger, he flies above the section. So any time that the section gets in trouble, maybe they're engaged with too many aircraft or another aircraft comes in and they're too busy dealing with the, the, the bandits that they're coming engaged in, the stinger here can then come in and help, right? Now, I've had mixed results with this. Why? Well, because one big disadvantage with this is that the stinger, he's all alone. He's completely isolated. And if he gets jumped on, or if uh, something bad happens to him, you know, maybe two guys uh, decide to, to take uh, the offensive on him instead of the section who are down low, he, he's pretty much done for. All he can do is dive and try regroup the section. But that's about it. So now on to the uh, main topics for this video. Okay, we'll start off with the 2v1 tactics. So. We're approaching this with uh, two fighters engaging one bandit. This here is ba uh, the bracket, right? This this is uh, bread and butter for most of the, the engagements that you're going to be going in uh, to. So we start off with two fighters in combat spread, 600 meters or so, engaged 
one bandit who is right in front of them. So they're both facing in the same direction. That's the, the offensive principles behind my method. Uh, what, what happens here is what you want to try to do to utilize your numbers advantage, you want one of your fighters to try bait the bandit into committing into him. All right. And what this does is that this allows the second fighter to get in behind him. All right. Now, many a times, the big mistake people make here is that uh, we're looking at the diagrams here with the arrows and whatnot. They think that here at this position three here, uh, a head on occurs. All right. They think that uh, both aircraft are going in to try get guns at the same time on him. That is not how this works. Right? That 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 negates the whole purpose of why we're trying to approach this tactically. All right. So what happens here is that uh, in this case, the bandit commits to fighter the southern fighter here okay uh the two fighters what they initially do is that they try to create some distance to them all right so northern fighter here he goes right southern fighter goes left they create more distance and this forces the bandit to commit to one fighter all right and in this case he commits to the southern fighter so the southern fighter what he's his job is to bait him in all right, and set him up for the northern fighter. And at this point here, he's not going in for a hit-on attack. Okay, what he's trying to do here is to merge. Right, he doesn't even like think about getting a hit-on. He he makes it look like he's getting into a hit-on attack, but he's not. All right, because you don't want to put him at risk at all. Because why? Why would you want to put him at risk? If you go in a hit-on, maybe he gets damaged. Maybe he even gets shot down. Granted, you'll take this guy out, but the whole purpose behind this is to make sure that your element here stays intact after an engagement. All right, we're looking for efficiency here. You want to knock this guy out for no losses. So the southern fighter here, he goes in, he turns left, bandit commits to him. He comes in here and he merges, doesn't go head on, he merges, all right? He flies past him, goes evasive. And the northern fighter, now he's in the position to get behind. He's probably already behind to attack and nails the bandit. So this is the bracket basic offensive operations for my method so far. So the bracket, as we've just discussed, that's the offensive bread and butter maneuvers for two on one uh, using my methods here. Uh, the next three uh, tactical maneuvers that we're going to discuss, these are the, the defensive kind of thing, right? This is where the the bandit is behind and is attacking the, the formation in this case. So uh, we'll start here with the half split. So Bandit comes in behind, and he singles out the northern fighter. And what happens here is that, in the same principle as the bracket, the fighter that gets engaged, he's the one that's going to set up the bandit for the other fighter to shoot down. All right. So in this case, uh, if you look at this flight path here, uh, the northern fighter, he's not, he's not taking a very uh, evasive kind of maneuver is a very like slow extended turn out to the south here and that's because he's setting up the bandit who's following him in the engagement for the southern guy okay so the way this plays out as you can see here in the initial maneuver uh the northern guy he's uh, extending out out to the west the southern fighter he turns hard south and this is the same principle as it is in the bracket. They're creating distance between each other so that the bandit commits, all right? Uh, in this example here, following these lines, where the bandit is assumed to be committing to the northern guy. Uh, in, in reality, of course, uh, he's not always gonna do that. He, he has a choice. And that's why you have the separation here, depending on who he goes up against, all right? So if he went for the southern guy here, then the southern guy is gonna take a similar maneuver as the northern guy. All right, he's going to be like a slow turn somewhere, trying to extend out, trying to draw out the engagement, all right, the engagement distance between him and the bandit, and then set up the bandit for the other free fighter. Okay, so that's that's the half split if they approach from behind. The sandwich here, uh, sandwich involves one fighter crossing the flight path of another. Okay, in this example here, the bandit he's already lined up on the northern fighter. And a northern fighter is now taking evasive maneuvers, hard turn, turn into the attacker, uh, turn into the abandoned. And the free fighter, he now just maneuvers himself in behind. So same principles behind the bracket, the half split, the sandwich, all the same.
where things get a little bit interesting here, the thatch weave. Now, it looks a bit complicated. And if you take a little bit of time to look at it, you realize that, well, between this and the last three maneuvers that I just showed you, it's all just the same. One guy baits the other guy, and the other guy gets in behind. But there, there are subtleties, right? I mean, uh, between these two, they are quite similar. Uh, both are defensive compared to the Bracadus offensive. But the Thatch Weave has a couple of extra like advanced principles behind it that not a lot of people appreciate. So the main one big difference is the, the fighters here, what they do is that they they turn into each other. Right? In all the other maneuvers, the fighters are turning away from each other. They're creating distance. But not in the Thatch Weave. In the Thatch Reeve, they close in. Now, the Thatch Reeve was developed in the early years of the Pacific War. Uh, the United States Navy guys, they were having trouble fighting against Zeros. So this is where the, the history behind this, uh, this maneuver comes from. Uh, the Wildcats, they weren't as maneuverable as Zeros and weren't as fast. And here, the Thatch Reeve, is, uh, is, this levels the odds with the strengths of the Zero. Uh, granted, if it's a two-on-one. <laughs> If you get into multiple bandits, then things get a little bit haywire. But example here is the, how it fundamentally works out. With the thatch weave, what you do is that you set your wingman up for successive attacks. In most of the other cases here, there's only one play going on. One fighter gets engaged, baits out the bandit, and the second guy slots in and try gets the attack. In the Thatch Reef, we're assuming that the first attack may not always be successful, in which case we need to set up for a second attack. So in the Thatch Reef, when the, the two fighters turn into each other, uh, once they pass each other, once they merge to each other, they then reverse their turns, all right? And then they do the weave again in the opposite direction. Now, what this allows is for successive attacks in the case that the first attack misses. And why would the first attack miss? Because if you look here, a uh, difference between the thatch weave and the previous maneuvers is that this attack here is a forward quarter attack. This is a high angle deflection shot, sort of like a, a hit on, except that the bandits already committed to the northern fighter in this example and the southern fighter. He, he's trying to get a shot in as he passes across him. So this isn't an easy shot, all right? Uh, when this was developed for the Navy, uh, their pilots were trained really well in deflection shooting. So in game, if you're, if you're trying to pull this off, make sure that you are pretty good at your deflection shots. And so if he misses and he reverses the turn, the defensive fighter reverses the turn and the bandit then gets into another uh, shot for the, the offensive fighter. Now, that's just one aspect. The other aspect is uh, it negates the advantage of the zero, if we're talking about the historical advantage, uh, the historical context behind this maneuver. Uh, the zero, uh, if we're assuming here that the attacker is the zero and the two fighters are the wildcats, the zero has far superior agility and maneuverability against the wildcat. But if you're pulling off this maneuver where you're turning into each other, uh, the maneuverability of the zero uh, sort of diminishes because you have the increased closure rate between the fighters. In technical terms, the southern fighter here, he's getting better mileage in terms of his turning with the zero than he would if he were in a one-on-one -on -one dogfight just trying to go in circles. This setup of the weave uh, sort of closes the distance between the the, the sort of like turn times between the fighters, uh, uh, the Wildcat and the Zero. Uh, it's it's kind of a hard thing to try relay across, but it's a, uh, and it's not really a big thing in, in, in terms of like how many degrees extra you can get in your turns uh, in this kind of like engagement where you're going head on and then turning back around and he's getting set up by the Northern fighter. It's not that big. Uh, but it is, it is something to keep in mind behind this uh, kind of maneuver. The last four maneuvers, those are the basics, offensive, defensive, and the switch around. Uh, this uh, image here, oh, sorry. Oops, okay, yeah. This image here, um, 
I just put this here because it it, it illustrates the the loose use uh, doctrine maneuvering uh, better than uh, my previous uh, explanation at the beginning. I think so. If we just get here, um, okay. So in this example here to illustrate the uh, free fighter, oh, that's what uh, the source that I got it from uh, talks about. The second guy who's setting himself up. So we have fighter one here, fighter two, and we have the bandit that's over here at the beginning of this engagement. So fighter one is already engaged. Uh, well, not engaged, but he's he's already behind the bandit, right? Uh, fighter two here, he's in a merge with the bandit, all right? So in this case. The offensive fighter, who's already technically kind of like engaged, he's going in for guns. Uh, fighter one here, he's going to be go getting into this turning engagement with the bandit. And what fighter two here does, and this illustrates the loose use concept, uh, he's going up into the vertical, and he's setting himself up for an attack. All right, he's yeah. This at this time, in point in time, he can take time to go look around. Uh, provide security, cover, uh, identify any more threats, but he's primarily setting himself up for the attack on the bandit, who at the point in time of his maneuver that he's done in this engagement of this diagram here, the bandit is already uh, set up for him uh, behind right there. And uh, he can choose to engage at this point because, as we can see here, the initial fighter that uh, started off, he's made one full circle around. And he's still behind, technically. But uh, if he finds that he can't get a good shot on the bandit at the end of this turn, he can just say to his uh, wingman, who's already set up for the attack, you go ahead, take the shot. Because uh, he's probably got a better angle, probably better speed, energy to close the distance and... Uh, just overall has a better shot than the initial uh, offensive fighter. So loose deuce offensive maneuvering. I hope this uh, diagram explains it a little bit better than how I initially described it in the uh, previous uh, PowerPoint slide. So the next three slides here, uh, it's not really a doctrinal or tactical kind of thing. I'm just giving the opposite end of uh, all the examples that I've just previously discussed. Uh, how if you were the guy that's uh, engaged in a one against two, how you deal with these tactics? Uh, I always find this that uh, I always find this aspect about uh, when people talk about tactics, they leave this out. It's like, well, what happens if I'm in the bad situation here? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> so uh, hopefully here I, I I can cover that that aspect of uh, the tactics and uh, help people out. So here <clears throat> we're approaching the bracket which we discussed before at the, the first uh, first offensive maneuver uh, regarding the loose use uh, doctrine. So if you're the fighter, right, you're, the, you're the single guy here that's being engaged by two, and the bandits, they go in to do the bracket. So Northern Matic goes, uh, turns right, Southern Matic turns left. They are creating distance, and now you're forced to commit your attack into whoever which guy. So we assume here in the first case, as it was in the first PowerPoint slide about this, uh, <clears throat> we assume that you're committing to the Southern guy because he may be closer or that's just how you you identify that maybe he's the bigger threat, maybe he's flying different aircraft, uh, you know, all number of different uh, tactical considerations can come in. Uh, but what you have to understand is that with tactics and everything I'm about to say here, it's all situational. Uh, other things like pilot ability that factors in. Maybe you know who the enemy is for, uh, flying. You know, if you're flying against, you, maybe you already know in your mind. You have experience against uh, this guy. He's a good pilot. This guy he's not so such a good pilot. Therefore, I can pull off this maneuver or this trick on him, but not on the other guy. You know these these things all factor in. But well, all I'm I'm presenting here are the basic kind of like theories behind it to give you ideas to how to approach when you do get into a real game. And these things, they they, they can be very helpful, all right? So back to the defending against the bracket here. So your fighter one, 
you engage against two guys, they have begun separation, you commit to the southern guy. So the main principles behind fighting multiple aircraft, this can be one versus two, one versus three, one versus five, six, ten, whatever. You need to keep your options open, right? Many a times what I see is pilots, they commit to an attack and they just stay with the guy. Now, if it's in a one-on-one, -on -one, that's completely fine. But when we're in a, in a furball dogfight, fighting against multiple enemies, you can't afford to do that. Because if you do, you're, you're basically throwing your options out the window and you are playing into the hands of the enemy's playbook. In this case, if the enemy is employing their doctrine or whatever, maybe it's not loose dues, but maybe double attack, it doesn't matter. If they, they're smart about how they're about to play this out, uh, you're screwed, basically, if you do that. So... That's the basic principle is that you need to keep your options open. Don't always commit all the way onto one guy. So in this case, if fighter one fails to get a high angle deflection shot on the southern guy, he doesn't still turn to commit into a dogfight, uh, turning dogfight with the southern guy because the northern guy is already coming in to set up. What he does then is just he just leaves him, right? Disengage and now turn to engage with the other guy that's setting himself up for an attack. All right, you you switch your offensive maneuvers from the southern guy who's now gone defensive and is flying away, and then switch your attention to the northern guy, because the southern guy here he's no longer a threat. He's he's facing away. He's behind you and he's turned away and he's flying the other direction. He now needs to make a maneuver to try uh, regain an offensive uh, position against you. The threat here now is the northern guy, so you deal with him, turn into him. Maybe you get a shot off, maybe you don't, but this is how you survive the initial engagement. And after this, it's uh, sort of like a uh, you go on instinct after this. But this is the, the basic kind of principles of how to deal with the situation. Uh, against the case two here, in case two, we're just assuming that the southern guy that you commit to, he turns the other way around. Uh, in which case, uh, same principles sort of apply. All right. Uh, in this diagram here, we're assuming that uh, you're able at the end of the turns here, you're able to extend away. All right, that's what the diagram here is assuming. Otherwise, if you look at this diagram, uh, the Southern Bandit, he, he can set himself up for a second attack as you're trying to get out, but it's assuming that you are able to extend away. Um, if we want to go in like a more practical situation as uh, how it would play out, and this is how I figured out in experience how it goes. Uh, usually, if you're the fighter, you've turned in, you're committed to the first guy who's now turned in here. Uh, maybe you miss, maybe you get some hits, you know, maybe you damage him. It's all good. But we assume that he's still in play. Uh, you're now turning in north to, as I said in the previous example, turn into the new threat. All right. The problem here is, though, the southern guy, he's already in a position to immediately come in and attack you. So if you try to extend away, he might be able to catch you. Uh, so what you want to do here is now just keep turning, right? Because it's the same same principles have uh, still apply. Once you've merged with the bandit and he's behind you and he's looking away, he's moving away, he's no longer the immediate threat. The immediate threat is whoever is about to get guns on you. So you want to deal with him. And the best way to deal with an attack is turn into an attack. So that's defending against the bracket right here. This diagram shows uh, attacking a section in combat spread. Uh, so the counterpart to this was the sandwich. So this is the opposite end of the sandwich. So how do you avoid getting shot down in this? Uh, it's the same as the same principle applies once you've engaged with a target and once he's no longer a threat and by I mean no longer like an immediate threat you just switch the target right don't don't commit to him because the second guy is going to come in behind you and get you so in this case we have here uh oh okay yeah so we're assuming here that you you have a height advantage and you're diving in to attack a section in combat spread You've picked out the northern guy to engage first. So you come down in, take a shot, maybe hit him, maybe you don't, doesn't matter. You do not commit to the turn in following him all the way, all right? 
disengage because he's now gone defensive and he's flying away and you've you've overshot but he's like i said he's gone defensive so he's behind you and turned away you then switch to the second guy right uh, now in this case maybe uh you might overshoot even the second guy as you're making this diving maneuver here in which case it doesn't matter if you get guns on it doesn't matter whether you get a shot off or not what matters here is the maneuver principle uh, uh stays the same you've in terms of maneuvering eliminated the threat because he's now behind you in this case here he's now facing away he's behind you and he's moving away so you've managed to come in, take a shot at one guy, and now you can extend away and get out. Uh, maybe you hit, shoot down the guy, maybe you don't. Maybe you shoot down both, in which case that's great. But uh, you extend away. You don't commit to this because you're in a one-on-two. One-on-two ain't good. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind about all this is that uh, people that go into fights looking uh, for an engagement with multiple guys right that's not how things work because the odds are against you it doesn't really matter how good you are uh it's not a good thing you want to get into most of the time uh these situations when they occur is because of necessity all right if it's towards the end of the game and you're all that's left and you're engaged with these many guys then you have to go in but there's no no rule that says that you have to commit to an engagement just for the sake of engage, uh, committing to an engagement you always have the option not to engage you always have the option to run away all right. Uh, granted, it's all like super situational. If you're at the end of the game, maybe you only have like a few tickets left. You have to go win. You have to finish the game. You have to kill these guys. You know, all these things factor in. But if we're assuming here in the context of just talking about tactical considerations, you don't have to commit to an engagement. Right. And you can always run away. All completely valid. So here is uh, the counterpart to the uh, defensive half split. And it's all the same principle. It's very, very similar to the uh, countering the uh, the sandwich in the previous slide here. Uh, we're assuming you're coming in on a dive. You've approached the combat spread here. You're attacking. You've attacked the northern bandit. Missed, maybe, probably, overshot. Doesn't matter. You follow through. And in this case here, uh, the southern bandit, you get another shot off on him because he's trying to turn in. He's assuming that you were going to go in and commit to the attack and try to get behind you, but you're a little bit wiser. You've kept up your speed because if you see this maneuver here, you haven't made that much many turns. So you have the speed and energy to commit to this maneuver, to commit to get a shot off on the first guy, bypass him, and then immediately go in and engage the southern guy. And after this, what you want to do is just bug out. All right, you just want to want to get out of here, extend away, because as you can see here, the northern guy which you initially engaged, he's now in a position uh, behind you. And uh, if you play this right, as I've said, you're, if you can see here in this maneuver here, we're assuming that you haven't made like many jarring turns, you haven't burned a lot of energy, you've kept your speed up, you will be able to extend away because the northern guy here, he's made defensive maneuvers, he's burned energy. And he shouldn't be able to catch you. So that's that's how this this plays out. So regarding two versus two tactics, um, I've never been in many situations where it was just a pure two on two. That, that usually very rarely happens. Most of the time, it's a two on one, a one on two, or it's a, a two on many. And so, or many on two, you know, reverse the rules. So. Um, I'm not going to discuss much because I don't have much experience. The, there is a lot of uh, work and study that has been done on two on two, and I have looked into it. But because I, I haven't actually had any experience in game with this kind of stuff, I'm not going to talk about it. And for the most part, as, as I can see, uh, engage with my experience, try to predict how it would turn out. Uh, so long as you understand the principles of everything that uh, we've said so far, the fundamentals of how the doctrine works, how the 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 logic behind approaching the problems, how they work. As long as you understand that, everything else just falls into place. Right? It just takes practice, and it just takes getting used to your wingman, how he plays the game, and how uh, what his habits are in the, in air combat. And once you get that in, once you get into that, then everything falls into place, and it will be fine. So yeah. 
that's for the two versus two part. So now we come to the one versus many, or the multiple aircraft for ball kind of engagement. Uh, there are no more spaghetti diagrams here from this point forward for the presentation, partly because <laughs> at this point, uh, it's more, more philosophical and more on fundamental principles rather than the actual maneuver by maneuver kind of textbook uh, things that you see. You, you can't draw it out because if you're engaged with one versus 10, what's the point of drawing 11 lines on a piece of paper? Am I right? It, it, that, there's, there's no not much point in that. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a hopeless situation, all right? I mean, I've been in lots of dogfights and I think the most I have in War Thunder is a one on five. I've been in a one on five but this was back in, must have been 2015, I think. I remember it was on the, I uh, can't remember what the name of the map is. I think it's like Fjords or Norway. I think it is Norway. It's the one where uh, one the Allied side doesn't start with an airfield. There's an airfield in the middle where landing craft are about to approach and capture it. But it takes time for them to capture it. And so for the first half of the match, you don't have an airfield if you're on the Allied side. Uh, it is a realistic match, by the way. So I got into a dogfight over one of the smaller islands to the south southeast of that airfield. And it was a one on five. And I managed to win that. I managed to shoot down three and the other two just ran away. <laughs> I didn't win the game, which is the sad part. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is possible to win one against more than two. All right, and I've seen other players. There are plenty of other YouTube videos where people are getting into dogfights against six, seven guys. Uh, sometimes even eight or nine over the course of uh, half a match, and they they can win no problem. All right, and uh, so as I've said here, just because there aren't any like textbook uh, maneuvers that you can see on a piece of paper that can be drawn out for you to look at, doesn't mean it's a hopeless situation. It just means that at this point in time, if you're not confident in your abilities as a pilot, or if you have yet to grasp the fundamentals of the tactics so far that I've described, uh, you're not you're not going to have much much of a chance in a one versus many. So don't try to get into a one versus many. Uh, but we're assuming here that you followed through most of it and that you are an experienced pilot or uh, you've uh, now come back to this video after playing many games and you've gotten a lot of experience. How do you approach this situation then, fighting against uh, many multiple aircraft? Uh, the first thing you have to keep in mind here is your main enemy at this point in time is information overload, right? So what does this mean? This means uh, your situational awareness. When you engage with multiple aircraft, uh, you have to keep track of all the different aircraft. You have to keep track of yourself, your maneuvers, your altitude, how much energy you have. Keep track of the enemy's uh, maneuvers, positions. Try to gauge their energy. And also, if you have friendly aircraft, now you've got to keep their positions and maneuvers and take them into consideration as well. So what happens here is that uh, the human mind can only really take so much information. Well, we're not computers or anything. <laughs> and uh, for me, at the, the height of my skill and ability back in uh, that, that match that I was telling you about in the one versus five, that was the max that I could do. Was track five targets at one time. And that was at uh, that specific point in time, right? I have never been able to do it before that. And I've never been able to do it since. It is, it's not easy at all, right? I was like in the zone. I was in the state of flow for that one fight, for that one engagement. So it, information overload, that is the main enemy once it comes into a one versus many kind of situation. This is what you have to keep in mind. So. What are the principles for approaching this problem then? So basic principles of the one versus two, as I've uh, said before, you have to keep your options open, all right? Do not commit to any one, one play or one engagement because in that case, all the other bandits are gonna get behind you and they're gonna, gonna take you out, all right? The next thing is to keep the opposition disorganized, all right? You have to keep the enemy on their toes. Uh, as we've uh, seen here in the previous examples, once you've dealt with the immediate threat, you've got uh, uh, once you've dealt with the initial engagement, the initial threat that you were you were committed to, you then have to immediately turn your attention to the next immediate threat that's coming in towards you. Right? That's that's so far the principles against the one versus two that I've described here. 
So in the one versus many, that stays the same. But it becomes more important because uh, most new people, or the first time that uh, people get into a situation like this, they always think that, oh, well, I'm engaged with like five guys. Uh, I've got to be fully defensive because if I don't, I'm going to get shot down. Uh, you, you can't do that because it's not a long-term strategy. In this case, it becomes attrition. If you're finding five guys, they can take all the time that they want. They've got more ammunition. They've got they have more more lives. If we're taking talking about like in the arcade, realistic, they 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 can uh, they they can afford to take the losses now and still win the game. <clears throat> so you can't always be defensive. You have to go on the offense, which sounds very counterintuitive, considering the fact that you're in and a very bad situation where the odds are against you and the enemy is all around you and they're maneuvering to get in against you. But you have to go on the offense, right? You have to start eliminating threats. Uh, this is the, the last sentence here about being a good shot. This this becomes really helpful. If, you, if you're a good shot, and uh, as I've uh, described in the previous examples here for the one versus two, most of the time, as I've always said, uh, maybe you miss the shot or you don't get the kill, you get hits. But usually all these diagrams here, they assume that the initial bandit that you go up against, you fail to shoot him down, then you follow through with the maneuver. Uh, in a one versus many, you've got to start eliminating threats. So being a good shot and not missing those shots when you get them and getting kills, that is very important because you've got to even the odds. All right, you've got to go on the offense. You've got to knock out threats, whilst at the same time, uh, through your offensive maneuvers, you're you're being defensive, if that makes sense. All right, like uh, for for example, if we go back here, through your offensive maneuver by committing to the first uh, bandit here. Uh, once you get the merge, uh, now you've 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 defended against it, basically. Even though it was an offensive maneuver, you've technically defended against it because now the bandit is behind you and moving away, right? Now you can deal with the next immediate threat, which is the second guy that was coming in behind trying to set himself up. So that that's like the philosophical principles behind one versus many, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's more mindset, all right? And it's more principles rather than textbook maneuver by maneuver, numbers, kind of like uh, tactics x and o's kind of thing it's it's all it's all in your mind at this point when you're facing many you have to be confident in your skills you have to understand your aircraft strengths and limitations the enemy strengths and limitations uh if you are in a situation where you know who your opponents are and that's helpful you you understand their mindsets hopefully uh most of the time you won't because in war thunder it's mmo uh, your random matches are going to be up against randoms most of the time. Uh, hopefully, you will know your teammates, but most importantly, you need to know yourself. All right, that's how that's how the one versus many. That's how you, you got to approach it. I have here a, a little excerpt from a book. Uh, it's called the Book of Five Rings. Uh, this is from the Water chapter. I think that's the fourth chapter in the book. There's only about five or six chapters in it, and it's by this guy here called Miyamoto Musashi. And this dude here, for those who don't know, he is said to be uh, the greatest swordsman that Japan has ever known. Uh, one of the, the best uh, samurai he is, and he has a track record to prove, uh, prove it. Uh, one thing you have to understand about the track record that people sometimes forget is that he won all these matches, and he wasn't, he didn't win these matches against uh, random nobodies, right? The matches he played against and he, the people he defeated were all masters of whatever kind of weapons that they were they were proclaimed to be part of. You know, what dojo or school or art form, uh, spear, long sword, short sword, whatever. He, he faced the best and he beat the best and he has the record. And so I, I got this from his book. And uh, this is just an, a short kind of like paraphrase. Uh, there's about five paragraphs to it. It's, it's quite short, but I, I didn't want to put it all on one uh, page because, you know, one of the cardinal sins about PowerPoint is you don't want to put so many words on it, the whole point of it. But uh, I just got this up here, so you can just pause the video and read what I've uh, condensed, some of the main principles that uh, I found were very, very helpful in uh, approaching fighting multiple enemy aircraft in War Thunder. This has helped me a lot, and there's... Uh, 
there's a little bit more to it. Uh, it's a little bit more advanced stuff, all philosophical. Uh, I didn't want to put the whole thing in, uh, not only because of uh, putting too many words on a PowerPoint slide, but because uh, I don't want to uh, give any of like uh, people, new players who are watching this video, don't want to get them confused or anything. But uh, as you play the game, and if you're still interested in this stuff, I recommend you go get a copy of the book and uh, look up the water chapter. It's towards the end of it. He's got about five paragraphs where he talks about how to fight multiple opponents. And uh, granted, most of this stuff is all related to sword fighting. But uh, towards the end of his book and towards the middle, he talks about strategic and operational things, which I never expected to find in the book about swordsmanship. But uh, that's what I was told uh, before I got the book was that if you read on to it, there's actually more to it than just sword fighting. He goes into tactics and strategy. And it's in such an, like, an abstract form that, uh, like I said, if you're honest with yourself, you just take time to meditate and think on it, uh, you can find that it applies. And for the most part, uh, when I approach fighting multiple aircraft, it was this one part of the chapter which always stuck with me. And I went back and reread it. And that's why at that point in time, which I, I mentioned before, when I got into that one versus five, this is how I approached the situation. And it worked out well. Yeah. So I've pretty much covered all that I wanted to cover in this video. Uh, it's basically all the basic principles and fundamentals to my method about air combat tactics in War Thunder. So just to finish off the video, I'm just going to give you probably one of the, the best sort of dogfights that I've been in, uh, where it was applying some of the principles that I've uh, mentioned how they worked out. So. What was the context of the situation? So it was, this must have been 2017, 2018. It was that time in War Thunder, air realistic match. Right? This is an air realistic match, right? It was a part of that time where mixed battles want to think. Okay, so I'm in this situation where it's towards the end of the game. The entire Our entire team is dead. Uh, we're flying Spitfires. So it was a British-American team. Uh, versus Russians. It was like a Cold War, kind of like post-World War II. That's how War Thunder tried to justify it and whatnot, but that, that doesn't matter. But all Indian matters is that this was back in the old days where it was specific nations against specific nations. And this made for far more interesting battles because you had characteristics of aircraft against certain characteristics of enemy aircraft. So the strategies, uh, every time you went into a different match, if you faced it up against a different nation, you had to adapt strategies and you had different playbooks of how to approach uh, the match. And it was a great time. But so in uh, this situation here, this game that I'm about to tell you how it turned out, uh, our entire team had crumbled. They were all dead. Uh, I'm flying with a guy, uh, his uh, nickname is uh, Dirt Diver. He's the commander of the 28th Expeditionary Attack Squadron. I'm not sure if he still plays the game, and I'm not sure whether that squadron is still around. But uh, Dirt Diver, he was a methodical kind of guy. I, I knew how he played the game, and uh, he was always a big fan of Boom and Zoom. Right? He His textbook uh, play uh, for any air realistic match was, and it didn't matter what kind of aircraft it was, which is why in this example went when Spitfires, but we're about to do something which uh, not a lot of people think about like uh, Spitfires should be doing. But uh, his... His method of approaching air combat was side climb, gain altitude, and then take your time taking apart the enemy. That's how that's how he approached. So here we are towards the end of the match. Uh, our team's dead. We're, we're in Spitfires playing against a Russian team, and we have seven enemy aircraft left. And it's a mix of I-16s, Yaks, and Lags. So uh, one thing you have to keep in mind uh, is that at low tier, because we're flying Mach 2 Bs here, Spitfires, against I-16s, Yaks, and Lags. So it's BR 3.0 around that range, a bit lower. You have to understand is that uh, the general rule of thumb for Russian aircraft at this BR is that above 3,000 meters, they don't perform well. The engine and some of their airframe flight performance uh, drops off significantly after 3,000 meters. Uh, we're in Spitfires, so we don't have that kind of problem. However, uh, if we were to dive down and engage, first of all, it would be a 2-on-7. Uh, and they have I-16s, and 
uh, certain yaks at uh, this altitude below, they can actually keep up, turn with uh, Spitfires as well. So it's a pretty dangerous situation. Our advantage of uh, turn ability is 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 not uh, as significant as it sh uh, as most people would uh, assume. You know. Uh, what I found is that most people assume that just because one plane is good in this certain aspect, whether it's good climb rate, good turn rate, good acceleration, they automatically assume that every time they face an enemy aircraft, that's what they should uh, go with, you know, play to their strength. But that that's not how it works. You have to understand your aircraft limitations, what it can, what it can't do, compared to the enemy, right? It's, the enemy always has a say. People usually forget this a lot. So... Here we are in Mark II Spitfires. It's two on seven. We have the altitude advantage, and we've come across the group, and they're all grouped up like this. All right, they're all pretty close because they 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 started to uh, ground pound after knocking out the uh, last uh, friendly that we had that went into the fur ball in the middle of the map. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to engage these seven guys in boom and zoom tactics and Spitfires, and we're going to take no hits, no losses, and win the game a two on seven. So how did this play out? So we've got all the seven dudes, uh, seven enemy aircraft, mix of I-16s, yaks and legs. Uh, they're all in a, a group in the middle of the map. And what di uh, what we do here is I let Diver go in attack because I know how he plays. And I let him go in, pick out a target. He hits it and then he, he uses his uh, speed to, to get out. Now. Uh, as I've said in my dogfighting video before, because the Spitfire, its energy characteristics aren't built for this boom and zoom type tactic kind of thing. You burn a lot of energy in your climb out from uh, the attack, the initial attack that you gain in the dive compared to other aircraft. But like I said, compared to the Russian aircraft that we're fighting here, this is this is fine because as they try to climb up to catch us, they too don't have the the energy characteristics to keep up to catch us catch up to us. So so long as we stay above three thousand meters here, we can do this, even though we're in Spitfires, and be as effective as a P fifty one who is doing boom and zoom tactics. So uh but how does this help in taking out the rest of the seven guys? Well uh what I do is that I hang back Initially, I let I tell I tell, I tell Dirt uh, we want to stay above three thousand meters, but just do what we what you usually do, just boom and zoom, all right? And we'll both take turns. So he goes in first, he dives in, he takes one guy out, and the rest of the uh, the the mob here uh, they see us come in and dive and attack, and then they try and chase. They they turn in, turn around, and they try to chase Diver as he's extending out. And this is where I come into play as they're getting above the 3,000 meter mark and they're in climbs. I then dive in, pick one guy out, and attack. So at this point in time, as they're climbing up above 3,000, they're extremely slow. They're ext out of uh, energy. Diver is shooting up into space here. He's getting out of dodge. And I come in and I pick one guy out. And uh, I don't uh, turn in and commit to try shoot anybody else down. I do the same. Once I take one guy out, I then extend. I do not, I do not care whether or not there is somebody actually coming in to, to chase uh, and attack me. I just need to maintain my altitude above 3,000 meters, take a shot, uh, get a kill, pull up, and then reset the engagement. All right, discipline. All right, this is what what it takes to be effective at boom and zoom. And so we do this for another like four or five times. We wipe out all seven enemy aircraft, and we win the game two on seven. That that's that's it. it's just as simple as that. Uh, but uh, discipline and understanding aircraft. It, the, the experience and time it takes to recognize these things, uh, that, that probably factors the most in when you're fighting against many multiple aircraft, all right? So it's mindset and it's experience. And, and once you have both, you'll be fine. So that, uh, that wraps it up for this video. I've got the sources here. If anybody wants to look it up, these are the titles and the authors of them. So yeah, thanks for watching.